Hello and welcome to Walking in the Word. We're going to continue our series today on the Jordan River and the parallels to the seasons of our lives. Today we're going to look at the last section of the Jordan River. This is the one that's probably the most well-known to Bible students because this section of the river is where most of the activity took place that's recorded in the New Testament especially. It's where a lot of the stories took place that were recorded in the Gospels, for example. So it's the most familiar to Bible students. We're going to begin today by looking at some of the facts regarding the Jordan River at this point in its course. At this point, the river begins to enter a plain and it begins to meander. Anyone that's ever looked at a river, if you've looked at it from a mountaintop, for example, you can see how that it twists and turns. You can see how the course changes as it goes through a wide place where there's not a lot of restriction to its flow. And so actually at this point in the river, this is just before it enters the Dead Sea, the river actually travels 200 miles as its course flows with the twists and the turns. But as the crow flies, so to speak, it only covers 65 miles. So the water at this point becomes salty, it becomes full of mineral compounds, it becomes cloudy, and so it's not clear. It actually is absorbing and picking up and carrying with it minerals that have dissolved into it. Also, the river slows in speed. Now remember that in the past we talked about the section of the river that, that was full of rapids, it was fast flowing, people actually kayak. You wouldn't be kayaking on this section of the river. The river, as we said, it widens out and so it slows down, which we talked about the principle of a venturi. When the banks are solid and they're close together, the water is fast moving. But just the opposite is happening at this point in time because there's a meandering happening. So you can already see parallels to the elderly years of life. Elderly people, senior citizens, don't move as fast as younger people. There's also some other very significant things that I want to point out about the contents of the Jordan River at this point. As I said, it's full of mineral salts. A lot, in fact, so much that at the point where it enters into the Dead Sea, there's such buoyancy. It's hard, it would be hard to swim or to dive into the Dead Sea because there's so much, so many mineral salts that it actually makes you buoyant. In fact, there's a research vessel, interestingly enough, that stays on the Dead Sea to do research and it's called Lot's Wife, that's the name of the vessel. It, there's no trouble with buoyancy. In fact, I would imagine that if a hole developed in the bottom of that boat, it probably would still stay afloat. There are so many mineral salts in the water. But the main contents of the, this, this section of the Jordan River that, again, empties into the Dead Sea contains three chlorides, and we won't get too technical and scientific about this, but these things are worth pointing out because, again, we want to see the parallel between the elder years of our lives and what actually is in natural, the natural content of the water. There are three chlorides that are very prevalent in the Jordan River at this point. There's sodium chloride, think table salt, there's calcium chloride up in the cold north. We love our ice melt in the winter for the snow. And in the summer, we love calcium chloride to put on dirt roads to control the dust. And then there's a third chloride that's very prevalent, and that is magnesium chloride. Now, the interesting thing about chlorides, 
And again, there are parallels here to life. All three of these chlorides have a purifying or actually a disinfecting quality to them. In other words, they can stop ruin and decay. Sodium chloride, if you do just a little research on the importance, a human cannot live without some salt. If you think about even sports drinks, Gatorade for example, there's a lot of salt in Gatorade because it replenishes the salt that's lost during heavy activity. And so we have to, we have to by nature, have a certain amount of sodium chloride in our bodies or we do not survive. Calcium chloride, besides it being very effective to melt ice in the winter and to, to control dust on roads in the summer, calcium chloride is actually a food preservative. It's a food preservative. It keeps certain bacteria at bay so that food can be preserved, fruits and vegetables, for example. Sodium chloride or I'm sorry, magnesium chloride is extremely important. Without magnesium in our bodies, we wouldn't do things like be able to build and maintain DNA and proteins in our bodies. Magnesium is extremely important if you understand that you've ever had a muscle cramp. Magnesium can go a long way towards relaxing those muscles and so it helps maintain muscle, it helps maintain nerves. It's essential for helping to control blood pressure and blood sugar. And so again, it's an essential element in our bodies. So having said all that, let's parallel this to the elderly years of our lives. Let's go back to, for example, the calcium chloride. We said that it's a drying agent. It actually draws moisture to itself and it helps in preservation. And I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that I had grandparents that when I fell and hurt myself, scraped my knee, could hold me and could dry my tears. Not just that, but elderly people, because of the years of experience and wisdom that's been deposited in them, have a wonderful ability to help heal our soul wounds as well. Proverbs says that a gray hair is glory if it is found in the way of the Lord. And so not just elderly people that have lived through life and have experienced many things and gained much wisdom that they can impart to us that are younger, but especially elderly people that are God followers, who are God lovers. They have that very, very much added bonus of having godly wisdom to throw into the mix of our lives. And so it's a wonderful thing to have elderly people who have been down the river. They've survived their rapids. They've made it to the older age that they are successfully by navigating the twists and the turns and the jagged rocks and the fast paced move of the earlier years of their life. And so it's very important to understand that the elder people, the elderly people in our lives can add much, much to us as we will just listen to them and ask them and get advice from them. So the fact that the Jordan River at this point was not clear, it was full of these dissolved minerals that it had picked up that were deposited into it through all of its course of flow is the reason that in 2 Kings, when the prophet said to Naaman, the Syrian who was a leper, please pray, pray for me and, and cure me of this leprosy, it's amazing that he actually submitted to the prophet's direction, which was to go dip in the Jordan River at this section of the Jordan seven times. Naaman did not want to do this because it's not a clear river. And so he says to the prophet, well, why can't I go to one of the clear rivers in Syria? There are crystal clear rivers there. Why does it have to be the Jordan? Now, here's an interesting fact. Years ago, we saw a documentary on the Dead Sea. And again, 
All of the water from the Jordan River empties into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest point that there is. And so everything collects in that sea. But there are actually doctors, especially skin doctors, in that region that to this day will write prescriptions for people with skin t conditions to go and sit near the Dead Sea for a certain amount of time every day. Because just this, the healing salts and minerals in the sea that go up into the atmosphere have a healing quality. So think about this. The man of God under God's direction said to Naaman, go dip in the, dead, the, the Jordan River, which flows into the Dead Sea. Go dip into the river at this last section of the river. Because there are healing minerals, healing salts, if you will in that water. So God was, God was wise in even prescribing go here. And also the spiritual fact is this, healing was found, healing of Jehovah was found in Israel. It was not found in Syria. And so God was saying, healing is in this land. It's my land. This is where your healing is going to take place. And so in this case, obedience required sacrifice on Naaman's part because in order to obey the word of the Lord that came to him for the healing of his leprosy, his skin condition, he had to obey what the word of the Lord was and go where the Lord prescribed for him to, to do this. So obedience to the man of God was key here and leprosy is a type of man's sin as a result of Adam's fall. And so there's all sort of spiritual significance, which I'm going to let my husband address in just a few minutes. But it's good to keep in mind that the Jordan River was a dividing or a separating point. We see it time and time again throughout the Old Testament. We see that, for example, when the 12 tribes were called to cross the Jordan, which was the boundary to go into the promised land. There were two and a half tribes that refused to cross over the Jordan. And so Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh remained on the other side of the Jordan. They didn't go into the promised land. It was a point of separation for them. It was a point of separation for them. Also, if we were to look um, at when Israel crossed over the Jordan at that point, when the tribes that went over, when Israel crossed, when the priests stepped, this is very significant, when the priests stepped into the Jordan River and they were carrying the ark with them, the river divided, it separated Separation speaks of judgment. Separating the pure from the unholy, for example, is a type of judgment. And so at this point, when the priests stepped into the Jordan River, the water split and they rolled back, believe it or not, all the way to a city named Adam. And so think of the spiritual significance of that. The waters of judgment or the waters of separation rolled all the way back to Adam. And you think about the Garden of Eden and Adam. And then one other instance that the Jordan River acted as a point of separation was with Elijah and Elisha. Elijah took his mantle and he smote, he hit the Jordan River and it split. And so when Elisha came back across the river, came to the river on his own after Elijah had been caught up, Elisha takes the mantle that Elijah gave him and he hit the river and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And at this point, when the river split open and Elisha passed through, there was a double anointing that came on Elisha because he had walked through that point of separation. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my husband and let him talk more about this section of the Jordan River. Well, <clears throat> you know, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of Naaman. And it starts out by saying that he was a servant to the king of Syria. 
and that he was a mighty man, and through him the Lord delivered Syria. So a lot of times we don't think of other people than Israel needing to be delivered, or that the Lord would use somebody like him to do it. But it, it gives a, a glowing report of him, but it says, but he was a leper. And so leprosy is the symbol of man's uh, sinful nature, okay? That has to be cleansed out of us. And so the interesting thing that I always liked about this story was that he had captured a little maid, and she was a servant to his wife. And, you know, a lot of us get... We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And so there we are, and we can be a beacon of light or something to somebody to steer them toward God. And she said, would God that he uh, would go down because Elisha the prophet will be able to heal him. I, I always think we... When you hear something like that, how did she know that Elisha could do that? She was taking a chance. Sending a man through a war-torn area, he had to get a letter from the king, and, and you know they were honoring that letter and letting him through. Okay, But she had nothing to go by except her faith in God because in Luke, 427 it says there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet but only Naaman the Syrian was cleansed so she had never seen this actually happen she just knew it could and so she sent this man which could have been a wild goose chase and so he had enough faith to go but he went to the wrong person. He went to the king. The king has authority over the kingdom, but the king is not the one through which the Lord works to do healing. Okay? So the king thought he was looking to pick a fight. I sent this guy for you to heal, and if you don't, we're going to have a war. That's basically what he said. But Elisha got word, and he said, Send them to me. And so, you know, a lot of people have different ideas of what salvation involves. And they want it to be a big deal. <laughs> he expected that Elisha would do some incantations or do something, and lightning bolts, whatever he thought, that something spectacular was going to happen. But all he told them to do was go dip seven times in the Jordan River. And at first, he got snooty. He didn't want to. You know, I'll draw a parallel to that later. But he went away angry. He said, But his servant said to him, If he'd have asked you to do some big thing, you'd have done it. But he just told you to go dip seven times in that river. And like Nancy brought out, he said, why can't I go to Abana and Farpar in Damascus? Well, like she said, at this point in time, the river is pretty turbid. Is a ter scientific term means it's cloudy. It's You wouldn't want it on your tongue. And why would that clean me up? Whereas Abana and Farpar, if you do a little research, they're like trout streams. They're clear, crystal clear, running water, something you think, well, that would clean me up. But it's that turbidity, those chemicals in there that have a healing property. And, and you can take that into the spirit realm. All the kind of things that we have medicines we think will help us, but it's the Word of God and the Spirit. And, the, and those are the things that drive healing and health. In, in salvation. And so, why seven times? 
Why not five times? Why not one time? Why not 20 times? Each one of those dips represented one of the blood sacrifices that were in the Law of Moses. You know, there was um, Passover lamb, the daily sacrifice, the red heifer, the sin and trespass offering. All these different offerings <clears throat> were represented there, and they're represented in Jesus' death on the cross. He was the perfect sacrifice. He covered all those sacrifices. If you study the way they crucified him, what they did with him, you'll see a parallel in every one of those sacrifices. Go back into Leviticus and see what they did. And, and they did exactly those things on the cross and in burying him even. And so um, when we come into, it says there's no other name given by which men must be saved, right? And so that name of Jesus has to be invoked over you. A lot of people think they can skate by. It says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And some people go away huffy. Ain't going to do it. Well, you're not going to let yourself in on the kingdom privileges. If you weren't circumcised, you did not, you couldn't be a priest, you couldn't be a king, you couldn't even partake of the Passover, you couldn't marry a daughter of Israel. None of this stuff. You were you were just cut off from all that. And in modern times, in the New Testament, it talks about in um I believe it's Colossians two, talks about being uh, circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the sinful nature of the flesh. Okay? And so that's what he was doing. And, you know, some people, if you said, go to the mission field and go to Africa or do some big thing, they'll do it. But tell them get baptized and they won't do it. And so it says he went and did it and his skin came like a child's. Okay? God wants us to go back to the garden where we were children and then help us develop into what he wants us to be. But we got to go back to the beginning, to the starting point. And, and this is a matter of obedience. That's all it was. He, what do you want me to do? Go dip seven times in the Jordan. That's all you got to do. And so he finally did. You know, the, the getting rid of your sinful nature is such an amazing thing. Uh, you know, it says to, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. That's how you pay for it, with his blood. He gives you the, the thing to pay it with, and you... You pay it. You, it didn't come out of your pocket. But from that moment on, you get the Holy Ghost to guide and direct you and be the dynamite, the dynamo in you, the power source that allows you to overcome sin. You can't do it by yourself. The law never got anybody, even Paul said, as concerning the law, I was blameless. But he was killing people and thinking he was doing God a favor. We have to come to the point where we understand that we do it, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Okay, not by our strength, we have none. Without him we can do nothing, it says. And um, the interesting thing that took me several years to get figured out was Naaman asked for something very strange. He asked for two mule burdens of earth. And to me, I thought he was asking for some reason. I didn't know why he wanted, but however much earth two mules could carry, he wanted to take it back with him. That's what I thought. But always, it's fun to go digging for treasure, isn't it? 
you know it's there, you just don't know where or what it looks like. It turns out that two mule burdens of earth means the amount of land that two mules can plow up in a day, which comes out to, according to their calculation, two acres. What did he want? He wanted a piece of the rock. He wanted an inheritance in Israel. And when we submit to baptism in his name, we have a right to an inheritance in Israel. Not the land, okay, but in the concept of what Israel stands for. Everybody who's a Christian has to understand something. You have come under a covenant, and you are now part of Israel. A lot of prophecies that come out nowadays, they, they, people's mind go to the land of Israel and to Israel in the natural. Paul talks about it in several places. Not all Israel is Israel. Not him who circumcised in the flesh, but who circumcised in the heart. And so he wanted in on that. He understood more than Israel did in the natural. What God was about, and he wanted that, and we should want it too. And so, um, and then a caution, He, Elisha wouldn't take money or gold or clothes or anything for this. We should uh, um, market salvation to people. He gave it to us free, we should give it free. And so he wouldn't take it. But Gehazi saw a, ch saw a chance to make some profit, and he went and made up a story. And what did he get for it in return? He got the leprosy. Okay? We don't want to sell what God has given us and what God has given to mankind. We don't uh, sell the... Simon the Sorcerer is what we have. It's God-given. It's not to be marketed or profited over. And so um, this River Jordan is amazing because, you know, at that point Jesus got baptized by John the Baptist. And what was going on there? He said, you should be baptizing me. But people don't realize John the Baptist was a high priest. His dad was a high priest, and that made him a high priest. And they were of the um, course of Abiah. And go back to, I think, uh, First or Second Chronicles 24, and it talks about how they divided the high priests into courses so they could all take turns. And... Um, if he was of the course of Abiah, that's the eighth course, okay? And when he baptized Jesus, he baptized him into the priesthood. Jesus took on the priesthood at that moment, and the next thing, John the Baptist was beheaded, end of the Levitical priesthood. And now Jesus is the king and a priest. And... Um, it's amazing that, you know, at that point the Holy Spirit came down on him and gave witness to who he was. And, and that's an important thing because people had to know who he was. He just looked like another man. Unless you had the Spirit of God working in you to recognize who he was. And uh, it's amazing because the course of Abaya, the next priest in line was Jeshua, Jesus. And so these things aren't just coincidental. God had a plan. It's still going. And don't get caught up in what's going on out in the world right now. You're not part of the world. You, 
Jesus said, I'm not of, my kingdom's not of this world. If it was, I just asked for 12 legions of angels, which, by the way, is 72,000 angels, which is exactly half of what you see on Mount Zion, 144,000. So the other 72,000 is in the making right now. That's the government of God coming down the new Jerusalem. So if you think they're going to resurrect the old Jerusalem, no, there's a new one coming from heaven down to earth. So I think I've said enough. Well, we trust that this has been an encouragement to you. And also, I just want to encourage you to sit and listen to and, and absorb the deposit, especially the deposit of God that is in our elderly citizens. If you have a godly grandparent or even a godly great-grandparent, an aunt or an uncle that has gained wisdom through their years, I encourage you to go and absorb some of that experience and wisdom that they have deposited in them. If you, if you don't have living grandparents, then by all means, find some godly grandparents to adopt. I'm sure they'd love to have you and love to impart their experiences and their wisdom into your lives. We in this culture, unfortunately, many times see elderly people as a burden or they're, they're slow, they meander, they, they don't have there so much understanding and information about technology, for example. But the fact of the matter is, what's deposited in them is of great value, but we have to be the ones to draw it out. We have to seek it. And I have never found an instance where an elderly person wouldn't be willing to sit down and give wisdom and understanding if they're asked to do so. So may God bless you. We pray that you are safe and, and kept in God's hands until we meet again. So we bless you. We send our love to you in Jesus' name.